Welcome to Declassifying the Paranormal. Here we reveal the secrets that sinister organizations attempt to conceal from the world, objects and entities that could shake the very foundations of what we think is, and is not, possible. Today we have secured documents belonging to the SCP Foundation, and will reveal to you the nature of SCP-4012. Item Number SCP-4012 Object Class, Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-4012-1 is, itself, surrounded with a 3-meter high security fence stopped with cold barbed wire and accessed through a level 8 standard pedestrian security gate, staffed by two personnel from Provisional Site 30. This fence and gate have been set up under the guise of a U.S. military installation, and appropriate signage has been erected. The entire structure is to surround SCP-4012-1 at a distance of 1 kilometer. All personnel monitoring expeditions are to take 20-minute shifts to negate the psychological effects of viewing the interior of SCP-4012. Personnel finishing shifts are to be blindfolded and made to lie down in a darkened room for a minimum of an hour, under the supervision and care of the site psychologist, and rotated out to normal duty after two hours. All access to the unredacted transcripts and video logs of expeditions into SCP-4012 are to be protected by Bergman slash Lynch incapacitation memetic videos. The Department of Memetics has analyzed memetic corruption within the logs for SCP-4012 and decided that the footage in the Bergman slash Lynch means should be sourced from horror films and uploaded to a private YouTube channel for maximum effectiveness. Under no circumstances is footage from poetry readings, science fiction movies, or religious sermons to be used in the footage, as these sources directly increase the memetic effects of unredacted content. Use of films containing amateurish acting, or acting which does not reflect realistic behavior, is recommended. All memetic corruption is in the process of being edited out of documents. However, as some of this content is the only record of certain aspects of SCP-4012, research is currently ongoing. Personnel wishing to read unedited documents without experiencing the full memetic effects must first consume a standard dose of agnostics. No non-D-class personnel are to enter SCP-4012. All personnel entering SCP-4012 are to be considered not lost but normal one. Description SCP-4012 is a large extra-dimensional space resembling Earth, but displaying significant deviations in terms of space, chronological precession, and dominant species. Certain elements within SCP-4012 have a mimetic effect on those remotely or directly viewing the interior. This mimetic effect is likely correlated with viewer perceptions of religion and normality. These elements directly impact the physiological and psychological makeup of a viewer who has prolonged exposure to the interior. See addendums, locations within SCP-4012 correspond to regions but not to distinct settlements and places. SCP-4012 is surrounded by SCP-4012-1, a large plastic fence with a perimeter of 27 kilometers, located in the forest outside Camden, Maine itself with a simple latching metal gate. A rough hiking path begins outside SCP-4012-1 and appears to extend into the early portions of SCP-4012-1. It is unknown who constructed SCP-4012-1, the gate and fence have no identifying marks except a small, spray-painted logo resembling a dock, located on the underside of the gate. The internal area that SCP-4012-1 encloses is impossible to measure because any subject entering SCP-4012-1 also immediately enters SCP-4012. Foundation expeditions have determined a point roughly 135 meters along the path segment that initially runs through SCP-4012 where it is possible for one to turn around and retrace their steps to SCP-4012-1 without becoming subject to the effects of SCP-4012, but this location is not consistent. Attempts to return to the gate past this position fail due to sudden inconsistent geography. Dominant species within SCP-4012, collectively designated SCP-4012-2, 
vary based on entrant. Stream video and radio can penetrate SCP-4012 with ease, however GPS has failed to locate subjects within, and satellite imagery shows empty forest. Most entrants to SCP-4012 follow a similar experience involving an eventual presumed cessation of life. All do not return. Addendum, Exped Alpha 3-Unredac This is the first expedition that displayed the interior of SCP-4012 in full. Previous expeditions lost contact with the subject after the 135-meter mark. D-112 stands outside of SCP-4012-1. He is a man in his late 20s. The weather that day is cloudy and somewhat rainy. D-112 has received an optical implant that streams video T degrees Celsius min and is connected via earpiece. He is also wearing an electric shock bracelet. All right, so I just walk along this path, see what happens? That it? That's it. Is anything gonna jump out at me? Like, a big slimy monster with 12 limbs or something? No, we don't think so. As far as we can tell it's pretty normal in there. If it's so normal, why am I going in? Command does not answer. So, I'll just head in, then. Yes, please do so. The delay from command has been logged but cannot be accounted for. D-112 unlatches the gate and begins walking down the path. The first 23 meters proceed without incident. D-112, can you please describe your surroundings? Sure, looks like Maine Coastal Forest, all right. Pretty similar to where I grew up, around Booth Bay. That's about an hour from here. Lots of spruce, moss, this trail has roots in it. Bit of a saltwater smell. Ahead on the path, there is a rustling noise. Two figures appearing to be an overweight man and woman in hiking clothes briefly appear walking ahead of D-112 before rounding a corner and turning away. You saw that, right? Indeed we did, D-112. You're going to be just all right. Nothing is going to hurt you. It's probably just some sort of refraction from the path in times before too. Like, other people who've entered SCP-4012. You're fine. I thought you said they weren't going to hurt me. They probably won't. Just proceed, that would be appreciated. All right. I'll keep my distance though. D-112 continues along the path for several more meters. Birdsong gradually ceases and no longer becomes audible. After about 17 minutes D-112 appears to have proceeded 100 meters. The time discrepancy is noted. After 112 meters, D-112 begins whistling the song It Was a Very Good Year by Frank Sinatra. Please stop whistling. D-112 does not comply. Command attempts to activate his emergency shock bracelet. This fails as well. The figures continually walk ahead of D-112. Singing, and I think on my life, hum hum hum. 25 minutes from entering SCP-4012's farther boundary, D-112 discovers the mark left by the previous D-class expedition at the 135-meter mark. What's going to happen to me after I step over this line? We don't know. You're the first person to cross over with a camera that can't be switched off. Am I going to be all right? I really don't want to die. You're not going to die. Relax. I think I should let you know the terrain is looking somewhat different ahead. How so? I don't know. It's looking more manicured, if I guess that's the right word. There's a lot more ferns and things that are on the forest floor. It's kind of pretty actually three. Noted. Proceed with caution. Okay. D-112 takes several deep, slow breaths before proceeding, steadying himself and calming himself. D-112 crosses the line and begins to proceed down the path into SCP-4012. As he previously noted, 
the ferns and shrubs on the forest floor appear less like naturally growing plants and more like an artificial attempt at recreating a forest. Small signs appear next to the plants around the 140-meter mark, identifying the species' names in Latin as well as the common names in a variety of languages. Frame-by-frame -frame playback shows the languages to include English, French, Hindi, traditional Chinese, Hopi, Aditite, Proto-Hungaric, simplified Mu Davic, phonetically spelt Proto-Uralic, and several unknown languages with curving and geometric characters. D-112 does not stop to inspect the signs. The hikers are still ahead of D-112. It is now sunny. At the 50-meter mark, the trees move from coniferous coastal forest to deciduous oak and ash. Flowering plants native to various regions across in the world appear in mulch beds. D-112, could you stop to inspect the various plantings around you? D-112 does not stop. D-112, please respond. D-112 appears not to hear command. The path beneath his feet changes to solid pine needles and soon to gravel. The forest is thinning out significantly and the path appear to branch ahead. D-112 does not stop. D-112, if you do not respond or follow orders, we will be forced to activate your shock bracelet. Is that understood? D-112 looks down to idly scratch a mosquito bite on his wrist. The shock bracelet is missing. D-112, how did you remove your shock bracelet? Please answer the question now. If you didn't remove your shock bracelet, was there some effect of SCP-4012 that you felt? D-112 does not respond. He reaches a fork in the path and proceeds left. He is no longer in a forest but instead in some sort of botanical garden. There are plants from across Earth side by side and beds together. D-112? The path passes by a fountain. D-112 does not turn to look at it. The water in the fountain appears to be moving more thickly than normal water and has a slight purple tint. He continues walking through the gardens. D-112, please respond. There is a bend in the path. A figure appears to be pushing a wheelchair with another figure, but they are obscured by an overgrown bush. D-112, say something. Respond. Can you hear us? The figures appear around the corner. The first figure is a humanoid entity dressed in nurse's scrubs with no facial features, aside from a large human-like mouth located in the center of its head. It is pushing a catatonic male human dressed in an orange D-class jumpsuit. Neither of the two acknowledge D-112, and he does not acknowledge them. Get out of there. D-112 keeps walking, occasionally glancing up to briefly look at trees or large plants. His eyes linger briefly on an unknown tree covered in thorns. Another humanoid mouth entity walks by, dressed in a suit and quickly carrying a clipboard. It is presumed now that this species is the Zeteration's version of SCP-4012-2. D-112 Get out of there now. If you can still hear us, please turn back. D-112 continues to walk through the gardens. He comes across a large, neatly mown field which the path intersects. Throughout it, human individuals dressed as D-class, hikers, and in various indigenous costumes wander. Two individuals resemble the hikers D-112 saw earlier. Another resembles himself. Mouth entities dressed as nurses tend to humans, while others dressed as gardeners tend the plants. All are silent. One gardener mouth entity gives a cheerful wave and smile to D-112, who waves back. The gardener mouth entity vocalizes a series of gurgling growls to D-112, who does not respond aside. D-112 keep walking. D-112, please listen. Do not interact with them. There is a large wooden building ahead with large glass doors. An image of a dock decorates the doors. Mouth entities bustle in and out. D-112 walks towards it. Do not go in there. 
Turn back now. D-112 walks up to the doors and pushes them inwards. Please turn back. The interior of the wooden building is a large lobby with skylights. There are structures similar to a customs or border checkpoint with queues with one-way gates. Mouth entities and booths are at the end of each queue. Aside from them, D-112 appears to be alone. If you go through those gates, you can't come back. You still have a choice. Come back now. D-112 proceeds down the empty queue. Please exclamation mark four. D-112 approaches one of the booths. The mouth entity at the counter begins to growl and gibber at him. D-112 nods and looks down. His orange jumpsuit has been replaced with a dark three-piece suit. Command D-112, please. I'm begging you, please. There's still time. Turn around and come back, please. You don't have to go there, five. From his suit pocket, he removes a small blank piece of paper the size of a business card and hands it to the mouth entity. It inspects it, inserts it in a featureless black machine behind the counter, and then returns it to D-112, who briefly nods. The entity waves D-112 through the gates. No, 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 no. Command begins whimpering 6. D-112 proceeds through the glass double doors at the front of the building. There is a cobblestone path with a mosaic depicting a galaxy in front, leading to an immense parking lot. There are cars of varying vintage and model, the oldest visible appearing to be from 1910, and the newest of unknown make, some lacking wheels. All cars appear to be in very clean condition. D-112 begins to walk across the lot. Command has noticed that D-112 is no longer blinking. D-112 approaches a silver BMW X6M parked nearby, opens the door, and sits in the driver's seat. The X6M has no license plate. There is already a key in the ignition. He turns it and the car begins moving of its own accord. The countryside surrounding the building and gardens can be seen, consisting of a forest from an unknown region of the world, with significant bare patches. D-112 exits the garden-slash-customs facility through a long driveway ending in a gate. He turns onto a long highway cutting through the forest. He drives uninterrupted for approximately 30 minutes. D-112 Aside from forest, there are no landmarks on the road, and it is perfectly straight with no curves or hills. D-112, I need you to answer. Abruptly, D-112 arrives at a four-way intersection, which did not immediately appear ahead. It is busy and is along a main street resembling a modern American small town. A number of buildings with 1920s-1930s architecture are occupied by modern American-based chain outlets, as well as specialized boutiques including probable juice bars within D-112's eyesight. He cranes his head to look both ways up the street. To the left the main street gives way to big box stores, fast food restaurants, and a mall. Notably all text is absent from buildings, save logos. To the right it gives way to large upscale houses. D-112 turns right within a break in traffic. I'm sorry. I'm so sincerely sorry. D-112 drives for approximately one kilometer before pulling into one of the driveways. Notably, all the houses are located along a river running parallel with the street. At no point previously did D-112 cross a bridge. In every backyard is a dock with a small boat anchored to it. He exits the car and approaches the front door. It is opened by a mouth entity dressed in stereotypically female costume, which gargles brightly and embraces him. It kisses D-112 on the cheek and leads him inside. Note that D-112 was homosexual and was in a relationship with another D-class prior to SCP-4012 assignment. Two smaller mouth entities, one in a t-shirt and shorts and one in a dress, run up and hug him, chattering and gargling all the while. D-112 does not hug them back, nor show any real reaction at all. 
We should have done better by you. I'm sorry. The house is similar to an upper middle class suburban house with a television, couches and chairs, house plants, a staircase probably leading to bedrooms, and a large kitchen with an island and dinner table. D112 sits down at it. Look, you're not a death row prisoner. We just picked you off the street and made you believe that. I'm so sorry, you were just living your life. You didn't deserve this. You had a life once. The mouth entity, which appears to be acting as D-112's wife, brings a large pot of steaming food to the dinner table. It serves everybody. The food is a porridge-like lump of purple grains containing live, wriggling pink worms. D-112 does not react. The wife mouth entity pours what appears to be Caro brand corn syrup over the worm porridge. God damn it, I'm gonna vomit. D-112 begins to eat with a spoon, very rapidly. The worms scream as he eats them. The mouth entities chatter animatedly and appear to be attempting to make conversation with D-112. We're monsters. Following dinner, D-112 ascends the staircase, gets out of his suit, and hangs it up in the closet next to a row of identical suits. He gets into blue pajamas brushes his teeth robotically in the small bathroom with a substance identical to the worm porridge, and goes to tuck the child mouth entities into bed. They are both absorbed in devices similar to a smartphone or handheld game system and do not acknowledge D-112. He stares at them for about 30 seconds, turns out the light, and then lies down in the bed intended for him. The wife mouth entity is already lying down, nude. It has no breasts but instead a large penis-like organ where they should be. D-112 takes off his shirt and looks down at his own chest where there is a vertical slit. The two climb into the bed and proceed to copulate. I can't look away anymore. I physically can't. If you're still listening D-112, I physically cannot leave my chair or alert help. It's something about you, D-1127. It always has been eight. Copulation lasts two minutes, and then both parties fall over and immediately fall asleep. For the first time in hours, D-112's eyes close. Almost instantaneously, D-112 awakens in what appears to be morning. He goes to shave in the bathroom and looks at himself in the mirror. His face is slack and relaxed. There are no expressions of any kind. Notably. Despite entering SCP-4012 in his late 20s, he appears to be roughly 30 years old. After getting dressed in another suit and drinking a cup of a dark liquid from a mug, D-112 climbs in the BMW X6M and drives to an office building beyond the mall, where he takes the elevator to a cubicle in an office. Every other worker is a mouth entity. One mouth entity in a loose suit runs over to where D-112 is sitting. It shrieks and gibbers at him loudly. D-112 nods and begins to sort papers marked with straight horizontal lines. The mouth entity, presumed to be the manager of the floor, walks away. The sorting continues uninterrupted for three hours. Command says nothing. D-112 leaves the office building and drives to a fast food restaurant resembling a KFC. The family mouth entities are present, having driven another BMW X6M to the eatery. It is evening already. The KFC is staffed by and serving only mouth entities. Outside of the garden area, D-112 has been the only human. The family enters and orders one eight-piece bucket meal and several very large soft drinks. The meal delivered, however, is more of the worm porridge in the KFC bucket, and the soft drinks contain the corn syrup substance. The family drives home in D-112's car, having abandoned the duplicate at the restaurant. They watch a television program, consisting of a mouth entity close up slowly opening and closing its mouth for 10 minutes. The previous bedtime routine repeats. Inaudible. The next day follows similarly to the last one, only with the family eating the meal at home. D-112 appears to have aged again, and the child mouth entities are larger. 
the evening includes D-112 helping the child mouth entities with some form of homework appearing identical to mathematics used in quantum physics. Note that the children do not ever appear to go to school. The next day after that is identical to the second day. D-112 continues to age. He appears in his early 40s. Mouth entities representing the wife mouth entities' parents visit for dinner. They spend the entire visit screaming and chattering at each other. Eventually the father-in-law mouth entity grabs the mother-in-law mouth entity by the hair and slaps it. It takes the skin on the other's forehead and rips it off, revealing a single blind, rapidly moving eye. The mother-in-law mouth entity screams and shrieks. D-112 does not look away. The days get shorter and shorter. One day the family visits a church-like building. The stained glass windows show various mouth entities worshipping a large exploding star set on a grid of some kind. A mouth entity dressed as a pastor shrieks for ten minutes before they leave. What if it's not the foundation? What if I'm the monster? Oh God, D-112. Oh God. It's all my fault. It's my fault. The town's geography is getting smaller to accommodate the shortening days. D-112 is in his early 60s by day 8, and the child mouth entities are leaving an identical BMW X6Ms, presumably for college. D-112 has said nothing. Once, when I was in high school, I sexually harassed a girl. She was wearing these, these tight shorts and I complimented her rear in a leering sort of way and she got very angry and very scared. I even attempted to touch it and at that point, you know... I got very red and then I started to apologize profusely and she seemed to shrug it off but I was reported to the principal and there was all this disciplinary consequence that had to happen. It was the only time. I swear, I've tried to lead a blameless life. I've tried. I think about her face every night, D-112. Every night. Since I've joined the foundation, I've sent a million D-class like you to your deaths. Told them it would be all right. But why? Why you? Why this town? Why this anomaly? I feel so guilty, so ashamed. My eyes hurt, I can't ever atone. You're not even dead. I can't ever atone. I am stuck with my sins for eternity. I am unclean, I am unclean, I am unclean, D-112. D-112 is in his mid-seventies. A full 24 hours at the monitoring site have passed, but command has not left. I want to die. Day 10 is only 30 minutes, a full 5 minutes of which is devoted to some sort of office party for D-112's retirement. He retires for the night, foregoing sex with the wife mouth entity. D-112 wakes up at what appears to be the middle of the night. There is a series of humming sounds. Command discovers their audio communication system is missing. He makes his way down through the backyard to the dock. He walks down the steps out to the water. He faces the opposite shore for 30 seconds before turning around to face the house. He then stares straight up at the sky. They do not match any constellation seen from any point on Earth. Analysis of D-112's focal point indicates that he is staring at the darkness between the stars. The stars begin to spin. Blossoms of color similar to phosphines produced within the retina begins appearing between the dancing stars 9. They are green and purple. D-112 begins to grunt and moan. This is the first time he has vocalized. He looks down from the moving night sky and stares straight left. The optical implant begins to move forward from his eye socket. D-112 is now yelling in pain. The implant breaks free of the optic nerve and levitates forward roughly 30 centimeters before spinning around and facing D-112. His blue pajamas are stained with blood, which is dribbling from his empty eye socket. He is sobbing from his other eye. D-112 begins to distort, growing in length while decreasing in circumference. No. The distortion on D-112 continues and his sobbing becomes more distorted as his body grows taller and thinner. Eventually the top of his head passes out of range of the camera. 
He is estimated after roughly 30 seconds to be only 2 or 3 centimeters in circumference. His height cannot be determined. There is a loud sucking noise somewhere above the camera and D-112's body continues to grow thinner until it appears to vanish altogether. The humming is now 80 decibels. Between the humming and the sucking noise it is unknown how the optic implant camera can be recording sound when the earpiece is gone. The optic implant rotates upwards towards the blossom of color. It very quickly speeds upwards, gaining escape velocity very quickly. There is no sign of atmospheric friction or g-force on the optic implant, and it quickly escapes the atmosphere. Objects similar to asteroids, planets, stars, nebulas, and then galaxies appear as the implant increases its speed. Eventually, all the implant passes are various gas clouds, which it continues to speed through very quickly, then nothing. Suddenly there are blinding, large flashes of light surround the implant. The structure of space around it appear to twist and bend. The humming has transformed into a kind of screaming. Large collections of electrically charged matter, producing light, flash around the implant. It begins to sail past the universe itself 10. The space around the implant appears to twist into a three-dimensional slice of a six-dimensional Kalabi Yao quintic manifold. The implant enters it. The implant bumps into the back of itself. A line of it stretches infinitely. Complex, monochromatic prism-like images spin around it. The manifold breaches 11 and begins to high straightaway pharaoh bridges turning twisting beyond the mesh 12 at the bottom of a long tunnel wherein the light 13 begins and the dedicant infinite is dancing at the end of the number line 14 an unmade bed in a distant place sleeping straight up our hide bounded decaying muscles are not our own and we are stacked puppets begging control by other puppet 15 and it spirals and spirals in the darkness Deeps eating chomp hooray its way up the puppet stack 16, leaping standing up 17 me woke, and dreamed a thousand million dreams weaving and twisting your way in and out of your skull a thousand monsters screaming wavy thing, and they're 18. There is no time there 19. We are sailing in deep waters now 20. Beyond the breakers 21. Whose any mystery makes every man's. Flesh put space on and his mind take off time woes, any mystery makes every man's. Flesh put space on, and his mind take off time woes, any mystery makes every man's. Flesh put space on, and his mind take off time woes, any mystery makes every man's. Flesh put space on, and his mind take off time 22. What happened here? Question mark 23. Spinning 24, spinning sound boom 25, glorious chant, do not be afraid 26, entering love glorious 27, void immense, infinite void, comforting and terrifying knowledge 28. No space. Hello, I child. Everything shrinks inwards before. There is a pop noise, and the optic implant falls to the forest floor on the other side of SCP-4012. Further tests have yielded similar results depending on origin of the subject sent in. Containment procedures have been updated in light of this test. Further information on the varying experiences of those entering SCP-4012 have been logged in Supplemental Document 4012 -1. This document's memetic corruption is currently in the process of repair and review. Dr. Raymond Brakestein, Acting Command, has posthumously been awarded the Foundation Star. Thank you for tuning in. We hope that you enjoyed this broadcast. If you did, please subscribe, like, and share it around. If you have any particular case files you'd like us to cover in future broadcasts, leave a comment below and we'll get around to it shortly. Tune in again tomorrow for more revelations.